Hey everybody, thank you so much for listening. Today we're going to be talking about um, making sense of interviews for your teams. Um, so as teams go through the process of customer discovery, they're going to be asked to develop insights um, and to develop a clearer understanding of the problem space and of the customer's um, jobs to be done. Um, and we want to give you guys a few tools to share with your teams so that they can more effectively do that. Um, and so that any changes that you might see in their week by week presentations are backed by clear evidence and clear understanding of the customer and the problem space. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about making sense of interviews. So just as a reminder and for you to remind your teams, the source of truth will always be from the customer. If you see any pivots in your business theses or you see any pivots in the business model canvas, anything that, um, that is significant week by week change for your teams, you're going to be asking them to point to where they heard that. So who told them that, which customer, which interview, what's the quote um, or the direct scenario that they talked with the customer about. So as a reminder, the source of truth is always going to be that customer or that stakeholder whom they talk to. Um, and this is due to the fact that we want these teams to be able to build a strong sense of empathy uh, by creating a connection with those users and a better understanding of who they are and how they hope to serve them with their solution. Again, as a reminder for your teams, the reason that we do customer discovery um, in order to better inform our solutions or creations is that there is a very large portion of information and understanding out there um, with regards to any problem space that are things that we really don't even realize that we don't know. So there are things that we understand that we know and things that we know we don't know but the vast majority of the information and um, how we think about the customer or the stakeholder, there's a whole portion of that of which we don't really understand until we actually have firsthand conversations with them where we can better uh, grasp their jobs to be done, better grasp a day in the life of the customer or the stakeholder as they're relating to that problem or pain point that you're hoping to solve with your solution. So again, right, there's known knowns, things that we know we know, there's things that we know we don't know, um, and then there's a lot of no, unknown knowns and unknown unknowns. So things that we don't realize that we are already understand about a situation but haven't really been able to articulate or grasp with regards to our problem, or things that we truly don't even know exist. Uh, so we push our teams to get as many customer and stakeholder interviews as they possibly can. Um, through these programs and through the i -Corps methodology so that they can get a better grasp of the ecosystem so they can get a better grasp of the problem space and how all of that might inform their solution or their startup. So we are asking them, you know, obviously this changes program to program. At the national level, we are pushing teams to conduct at least, at a minimum, 100 interviews over the course of eight weeks. Um, most of those, most of the teams these days are pushing well beyond 100. Um, they're pushing towards 200 interviews over the course of eight weeks. In a lot of the programs that occur regionally or at the university level, that, that number might be significantly decreased depending on how long your program is. Uh, but for short courses, ones that run three or four weeks, we're typically looking for 20 to 30 interviews. Obviously, if you have a program or a course where you're teaching this methodology that runs a full semester, you probably want to increase that number. Um, you should probably be pushing teams for a minimum of about five interviews per week. Uh, and this is because they need to continue to um, continue to push to understand the customer and the stakeholders and also continue to remain flexible. So as they morph their solution and pivot their solution based on what they're hearing, they may also change who they think they need to talk to. So when they've talked to all these people, they essentially wind up with notebooks filled with notes. Hopefully they're taking notes during their interviews, or rather you should be encouraging, encouraging them to take notes. Um, you know, whether it's a notebook or whether it's on their computer, but highly recommend they, if they're doing in-person interviews, that they use a notebook so they're not hiding behind a screen. If it's virtual, 
a computer is um, taking notes on your computer is more acceptable. Either way, it's it's best to have at least two people um, in each interview so that one can manage the or organic feel of the conversation and keep the interviewee at ease, and the other can be managing capturing key moments in the conversation, key scenarios, or key quotes um, that might drive any changes to the way that they're thinking about the problem. So today we're really here to talk about how your teams can begin to understand what's really being said um, by their stakeholders and by their customers. And I'm going to walk you through a few different tools. I'm going to start a little bit with some concepts relating to insight development um, from these notes and quotes pulled from interviews, and then we're going to work our way into different mapping techniques. So basically, the way that it works is the teams will need to gain insights from their customers. They can think about it as, um, you know, collecting data, but in this case, the data is qualitative. So it's going to be, again, notes or quotes, and they should be doing that across their interviews and be looking for pattern recognition from their interviews. So it's one thing to hear something from one person, but it's really not really valuable until they're able to validate it across several users or several individuals. Um, so they should be looking for similar um, similar things that have been said, similar scenarios, similar pain points talked about, similar problem spaces, um, similar descriptions of processes or jobs to be done across multiple interviews, um, and they should be able to look for that pattern recognition to begin to define what's really going on. So we have to ask ourselves, how do, how do we or how do our teams manage all of this information? Um, you know, typically the speed at which these programs are running, we're not necessarily looking for, um, you know, highly detailed Excel spreadsheet or word for word transcribed interviews. Often what we're going to end up with are notebooks that look a little bit like this, where we're starting to see them scribble out like keynotes or key things that they heard during the interviews and they start to go back and highlight those things that they know that they've heard before or they think that they've seen in another interview or things that they think really stand out that they're hoping to validate um, in some additional future interviews. So we're asking them to take that information and start to group and categorize or label their notes from their interviews. And again, we're not asking them to do this in some um, very elaborate way that is very time consuming, but rather to keep in mind that this is a rapid uh, methodology of which there's meant to be a lot of iterations. So doing this in the most simple way possible is highly encouraged, whether that's, you know, grouping key quotes from posts and putting them on post-its and then grouping them that way or whether it's uh, doing it in an Excel spreadsheet or doing it on a whiteboard as a team or a virtual whiteboard as a team. Really any kind of rough way that they can begin to capture and grasp those patterns and then categorize those larger groups of um, common trends that they're seeing in the interviews. That's what we're looking for them to do because they're going to need to be able to do this on the fly, week by week, and very quickly integrated into their weekly presentations and feedbacks with um, the teaching team of various programs. So again, we're looking for patterns across the interviews. So it has to be, we're looking for things that have been heard more than once. Obviously a sample size of one is not um, what is acceptable. I mean, this is not survey-based data, so we're not looking for, you know, hundreds or thousands of, of data points to validate the survey results, but we are looking for more than one. Um, it should be heard from multiple voices in order to be validated. Um, then we would ask that the individuals can, uh, an exercise that the teams can undergo to kind of help them manage all of this information, uh, to help them better understand their insights through the eyes of the customers is to label their insights in the voice of the customer. So if you have multiple people talking about um, data security being a big issue across the business and um, it kind of causing problems with various business processes, then perhaps you would group uh, a set of quotes from those interviews in into a statement like, we need security measures that are easily adopted by employees, right? So this might... Um, this would help you to group that set of quote unquote data points from the interviews into the voice of the customer through the eyes of the customer and in a way that it's an insight that you can now leverage to make a big change as a team into your weekly um, report outs and into your solution. So these groups are your insights um, and again you would want to use them to pivot your solution to meet your customer needs. 
So the real question for your teams is whether or not they've validated or invalidated their customer segments and their value propositions. We want to really focus them on the customer segment and value proposition within their business thesis. So that's the priority customer segment and the priority value proposition for that customer segment. And then also the multi multitude of customer segments and value propositions that they may present in their uh, business model canvas or their mission model canvas. So they need to be asking them the question of um, whether or not their interviews and the insights that they've developed are allowing them to define these customer segments and value propositions and um, allowing them to do so by through evidence, through evidence from these conversations, from these interviews. So as a reminder, the process here is they're going to be setting out um, a hypotheses, um, multiple hypotheses and assumptions. They're making guesses about what they expect to hear from these interviews. Then they go conduct the interviews, so that's the testing portion. They're asking the questions to test their hypotheses and their assumptions. And then they come and debrief from that interview, review their notes. They're going to assess, which is the listen part, plus the analyze, analyzing part, which is post-interview. Taking a look at your notes, debriefing with your team, checking to understand what it was that you heard and leveraging what it was that you heard, so the insights to adjust or pivot your solution or to guess again and to conduct another round of interviews with the same group of people or um, if it's discovered that you need to reach out to a new group of people. So again, all changes that teams make need to be evidence-based. So, you know, a lot of the teams that we encounter and a lot of the participants that we encounter in these programs tend to be very, very well versed on how to collect and analyze data, uh, quantitative data. Um, so even making sense of, of, of concrete numbers like quantitative data or even um, qualitative data that is survey based, it can be hard because you're still, you're looking at black and white numbers, you might be graphing them over time or over some other category. And then you're still needing to develop a, um, conclusions based on what you're looking at. Uh, but even those conclusions are interpretations. So you can imagine if that can be a little tricky and sometimes gray, um, even, even with the black and white concrete numbers, then you can imagine what it must feel like to try to make sense for the ambiguous quotes and notes and discussions that they've had. Um, so we just try to bring this to their attention because uh, they're going to be thinking about data in a very different way and you need to help them understand that qualitative data from interviews means quotations, notes, specific scenarios. They should be really pushing in these conversations to hear, tell me a time when, give me an example of. They should be looking for those very concrete examples of things that have occurred that can demonstrate the customer behavior or the customer um, the customer behavior um, needs to be more dominant than what the customer says. So I'd rather hear a specific scenario that the customer interviewee went through that demonstrates exactly how they behaved when dealing with the problem space um, rather than to hear them talk um, ambiguously about the problem space and, and to kind of theorize about how they feel about it or theorize what they wish would happen. We should keep them away from those sort of future state um, statements from customers, but get them to talk about concrete examples. So we've sort of talked through the idea of insight development and how to leverage those insights to pivot on the solution. Um, we also want to talk a little bit through uh, various maps that teams can use to make sense of their data. And so we're going to go through some of these mapping examples. We're going to start with the customer. Um, so to start with the customer, you really need to identify them. And what we mean by this is we don't mean that you need to tell us um, their name and their job role, their job title, but rather you need to identify them and characterize them in a more... Um, in a more qualitative way and also in a way that more closely relates to the specific ecosystem that your teams are looking at, the specific problems that the teams are looking at. So how might we um, categorize them, right? There's a lot of different ways to define and categorize the people that we're talking to. We're going to walk through, through the, a few of those examples right now. So one way to do this when you're first kicking off, this is a really good useful tool at the beginning of an interview process. When you're first kicking off and you've got uh, let's say your first set of, um, obviously depending on the program, but let's say your first set of 10 interviews, you want to start to understand how they relate to one another in terms of their needs, their motivations, and the problem space. So you're going to start with a guess about 
Um, you can kind of leverage these first interviews to um, help you understand who else you need to talk to, where there are gaps, and who you've already spoken to, and also a bit, little bit more about how they relate to one another. So you can, there's two ways you can use the interview positioning map. You can use it before you even start any interviews um, to start to try to understand who you think might be in the ecosystem, and then to also sort of immediately after the first batch of interviews begin to categorize them. So the example, the image to the left here is an example for a project where we were uh, trying to better understand um, the ecosystem around a health and wellness nonprofit in Savannah, Georgia, uh, whose goal it was, mission it was to develop programs, uh, develop mechanisms to improve the health and well-being of the citizens of Savannah, Georgia. Um, and we, you know, a lot of these events, et cetera, were very like festival oriented or volunteer oriented. So we started off with a positioning map where we felt there might be a spectrum of healthy to non-healthy residents. We also thought there might be a spectrum of um, residents that were highly involved in the community to residents that were not very involved in the community. And we started with that very simple um, set of axes to try to help navigate um, who we would want to talk to and where we felt we would get the most lift out of programming. So obviously the people that are incredibly healthy and very involved, not necessarily who we need to target because they're already involved, but we could get a lot of lift from them. Um, and then trying to understand where we really felt there was space to move people into that top right quadrant. So if we could get people that were very healthy but not very involved in their community more intrigued, obviously that would be a good group to drive um, drive programming. Or if we get, could get people that were very involved but hadn't yet taken um, individual mission towards health, if we could get them to think about their health in a better way, um, that might be a, another group that we could clearly move and easily move. We saw the people that were sort of not con not connected to the community and also not necessarily interested in their own health and wellness as being a group that would be very difficult to to move in that direction. So we used this map to figure out who we wanted to talk to. We wanted to talk to all groups, but we also used this map when we were developing our solutions to try to understand who we would want to target first. Another way to build an understanding of your customer is by using an empathy map. Uh, so an empathy map allows you to start to think about your customer through a day in the life, especially a day in the life in the, in the particular job or role or set of jobs that they do that relates to your problem and your solution. Uh, so an empathy map, what you would do is you would essentially think of a particular customer segment or seg uh, customer group, and you would go through the process of, as a team, thinking about what is it that they are thinking and feeling on a daily basis as they go through this particular job that needs to get done. What is it that they're seeing in their environment as they're going through this? What is it that they're hearing from other individuals in this environment? And what are they saying and doing? What are the major pains that they're experiencing as they're trying to get this job done and the major gains that they're experiencing as they're trying to get this job done? So if we were to give um, an example, we might think about a nurse. Uh, let's say we were working on um, creating some sort of so solution to manage a nurse's schedule better during the day and her, her bureaucratic tasks uh, so that she or he, he or she may get back to taking care of the patients. What that nurse might be thinking in her current um, situation, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use Corona as an example here, but rather just generally, let's say pre-Corona, she might be thinking or feeling that she is very overwhelmed by her caseload. Uh, she might be thinking, I got to get to the next patient. Um, she may be seeing other nurses. She may be seeing a manager. She may be seeing um, multiple patients. Um, she may be hearing from other people. Did you get to this, that, or the other task? Are you, you know, you got to move on to the next patient? What she may be saying or doing with the patients is to try to rush them through any particular uh, job that she has to get done with them. Uh, she may be attempting to create a space of care, but maybe feeling also the time pressure. So major pains might be related to her caseload and her ability to manage um, all the tasks that she has to get 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 done in that day. You know, a gain may be that she's already using. Let's say, for example, a gain is. Um, they recently acquired a, a hands-free way of checking blood pressure, and that's a, a big gain in her day that's saving her some time. Um, so, again, this empathy map allows your team to get a little closer and put more definition around the customer. When your teams are thinking about customer segments, they'll often 
um, start at a very kind of surfacey level and that's totally fine. The idea is as they um, work through their customer segments and the related value propositions that those customer has, um, you want them to start to get more defined on those customers. And I don't mean, you know, I'm not looking for them to say soccer moms between the ages of 35 and 37, or I'm not looking for them to say, um, you know, a help desk operators that, um, you know, again, from the ages of, let's say, 25 to 35, I'm looking for them to get to a detail with regards to the customer related to the value proposition, related to the customer behavior. So is it soccer moms, soccer moms or dads, parents who need a meal on the go for, go for their kids, right? The idea is that, you know, people that are rushing their kids off to activities might find themselves in a position where they need a meal on the go. They need dinner last minute. Nine to fivers. So nine to fivers who are busy business people who need a breakfast or a lunch on the run. They just don't have time between their meetings. They need to grab and go. Dog walkers, you know, perhaps somebody who's, it's not like a professional business person, but it could be somebody who is in a dog walking career, um, but still finds themselves going from job to job and wants to grab a quick meal as, as they're working, as they're walking the dogs. You can see there's a value proposition for all of these groups um, that will drive a singular solution. Okay, so another place where you can uh, start to define your customer segments or tools by which you can start to define your customer segments um, are things like profiles, personas, and archetypes. And I want to talk through all three of these because they get used um, interchangeably a lot and there's some key differences. So a profile, a customer profile, is going to be um, an, a, an outline of a real person that you talk to. A persona is going to be similar to a profile. It's going to cover similar attributes, but it's going to be basically a made-up person that re is representative of those that you've talked to um, or an individual that you talk to. So in case you have people that want to stay anonymous. Um, archetypes are really a group of people with similar motivations, needs, jobs to be done, etc. So mostly archetypes are defined um, by kind of their highest motivation or their highest job to be done. Um, so we're going to talk, through, look at a few of these examples. So as you can see here, Judy, the director of UX, she is. This is a profile. This is a specific director of user experience that was spoken to, um, with very specific uh, facts about Judy, eight years of UX experience. Um, we were able to get to, um, you know, particular pain points and goals that Judy had through the interview. Um, particular tasks and behaviors. So something like this is a really good template to use. Even if you don't share it, it's an excellent template for your teams to use as they're going through the interview. They can start to organize the information that they're hearing in real time based on some of these categories represented here. Here is an example of a persona. So uh, this is demonstrating a little bit of the empathy map that you can see there in the bottom left, as well as the values. Um, there's, a, there's a values chart wheel in the bottom right. Another example of ways you can kind of take what a particular interviewer said and start to capture what their key values are. Um, this is a made-up biography here with this Anna Mar Mariner character, but it gives you the idea of who she is um, what she's doing for work, and it can help you categorize people as you're thinking about who you're interviewing. So here is an example of an archetype. This was for a project with Coca-Cola to build um, to build an alumni program, and various groups of people that were interviewed had particular motivations for why they would in fact want to engage with an alumni program of an ex-employer. Uh, one of the archetype categories was brand champions. So that was the group of alumni that were very, um, very, very, um, you know, caught up in the brand of Coca-Cola and wanted to continue to um, be advocates for that brand, be champions of that brand, um, and were in intrigued in the idea of in involving themselves in an alumni program because of their love of brand um, and the meaning behind it. So another type of map is the stakeholder map, um, and this allows you to consider everybody in your ecosystem and begin to define people based on their relation to one another 
um, for the problem space. So this is a great map to showcase to your teams um, as they think about who they're interviewing, making sure that they're covering all people in their ecosystems. So here we know that you know individuals never really act alone. So you might have a particular customer, but they are most likely getting motivated um, and influenced by other people in their ecosystem. So some people may positively influence them towards your solution or product. Others may be um, pulling them away from your solution or product for, for various reasons, very mo various motivations. Stakeholder types um, for you to consider to share with your teams. You're going to have a decision maker. So this is ultimately the person that decides to adopt your product or solution. You're going to have the buyer. And sometimes, you know, this might be the same as the decision maker or it could be a different person entirely. You're going to have an influencer who's going to likely sway the decision to adopt this product, um, an end user. Um, so again, some of these roles, it's not necessarily each of these roles is a different individual, but rather these are different hats. So the end user may also be the decision maker, but there might be a manager that decides to implement a new tool that his team might use. Um, early evangelists, these are similar to influencers, um, but these are going to be people that have adopted the product early and are um, sharing with you their great experience. A saboteur is really somebody who basically has a contrary motivation to this particular solution being adopted, um, and they're going to do everything in their power to prevent it from, from coming into the ecosystem. So just, um, you know, to give your teams an idea, here's an example of a chain of influence and a way for them to think about these different roles um, and who, who does what. So let's say you had a product for a baby. The parents may be the buyers. The doctor may be, um, one doctor may be the recommender. There might be a salesperson involved. You might have recommendations from family and friends. Um, you might have saboteurs uh, that are other doctors that want a different product for your baby, um, or a saboteur might be somebody who doesn't believe that that product is good for your child, that sort of thing. Um, so just help your teams understand how they might look at their ecosystem and think about who each of these individuals are. And when they're communicating back customer segments, encourage them to use these labels um, as they're talking about who they t interviewed, because if you can get them away from job titles and roles, just using job titles and roles, but rather also using the role within the ecosystem, you can start to um, help them gain clarity about where people sit and how it impacts their ability for their solution or their startup to uh, take hold. Here are a couple other examples of stakeholder maps. Um, you know, I'm showing these to demonstrate that this, a lot of these programs are very fast, uh, so people don't really have the time to make really elaborate diagrams um, in PowerPoint. It's fine to just sketch some things out to get some basic understanding up on a whiteboard or in a notebook. Um, you know, even these are a little bit more elaborate than they need to be. Uh, but just encourage your teams to keep it rough um, as they go through this process so they don't spend too much time on this type of mapping. It's meant to be a tool or a way for them to organize their information. So that was a stakeholder map. Another map that's very similar to a stakeholder map is the ecosystem map. So this is not just the people involved, but the things involved. Um, so an ecosystem map might look something like this. You can see on this map that it's not just, again, it's not just the people, uh, but rather you start to see places in here, um, different organizations and buildings, different technologies, databases, systems, um, anything that might um, impact the job or set of jobs to be done. Um, other types of map include workflows. So workflows really ask us, um, how are we doing work today? Um, and how might, um, how might work be done tomorrow? So you can do workflows for both the current state of the process or the jobs to be done, or you can have teams do workflows for, as they start to think about their solution, they can start to think about how their solution maps into a workflow or how their solution might, might change a workflow. So there are, when you think about workflows, we want you guys to, we want the teams to be thinking about steps. We want them to be thinking about what steps are working well, what's not working well, what can they change, what can they not change. Um, you know, they should be thinking about through all these things. And there's a lot of different types of workflows. I'm going to go through a couple quick examples. So we have workflows, traditional workflows, which look like a traditional process map with decision-making points and starts and ends. 
Um, so you can see the steps are in the boxes and the decision making points are in the diamonds. Um, and it kind of goes through that. This tends to be very process centric, not very customer or user centric. Uh, it can be a good way to just get initial thoughts down. Um, obviously these different processes are mapped to specific people over here on the left. Um, but even so, these are the process steps. It's not what the person is experiencing during those steps as an individual. So if you think of a customer journey map, which is the next type of workflow, you can actually map the process steps, as you see across the top, along with the emotional state of the individual who's going through that process, the specific employee, stakeholder, customer who is going through that process. Where do they feel joy? Where are they having significant pain? You know, where are they having confusion? And this type of map can help you start to identify as a team, can help your teams identify where they could possibly, um, you know, integrate a solution that could actually create lift. So if you can create a solution that addresses this particular step um, or a solution that addresses all the steps where you kind of see a, a sad face or a confused face, uh, then you've got a solution that's going to get people to really want to adopt it because it's going to elevate their emotional state as they're trying to get this job done. Uh, a final workflow example is a service blueprint. A service blueprint comes from the field of service design. Um, and so this is, again, it's user-centric service design. Um, and basically what you want to do is in a service blueprint, you, again, you have the customer journey or the stakeholder journey, the, the key person that you're looking at, you have their steps in the journey um, articulated across the top. And then what you do is you start to map out um, different people that they might be engaging with, whether it's um, employees from, let's say they're engaging with a product and then they have to engage with employees um, from the company who created that product. Uh, they might have some frontline employees, customer service employees. So you map out how they engage with other individuals. You map out um, how they might engage with technologies related to that product or that product ecosystem. And then you start to map out, um, so these might be front stage technologies, and then you start to map out you know, any kind of backstage systems, databases, um, set of uh, other employees that might support that step. So let's say it's a, let's say it's an individual who's visiting a website You've purchased a product, let's use Amazon, purchased a product, goes to Amazon, realizes their product hasn't, hasn't uh, arrived yet, goes on to the support chat on Amazon's website, so here's them visiting the website, that's a step. Here's them engaging in the support chat, let's say down here, you know, we don't have these boxes down here because I'm using a different example, but for example, let's say the, it, at first it's a bot, so it's a specific chat bot that is engaging with them, and then it kicks to an actual individual. So those are people that are now, like, they, these are now... Um, the chat bot is, is helping to maintain the support chat and the um, individual that it might kick it to is an actual human that is a French stage employee that is engaging with that, that individual to solve the issue. So it's a way for you to start to map out more than just the customer journey. It starts to map out the, kind of the broader ecosystem of things uh, that are related to the existing workflow and how um, allows teams to think about how they might adjust that set of that process um, using their solution. Okay, so the next um, type of map that we're going to look at for teams is a value chain. Um, and this should be the, the last one that we're going to look at. So a value chain is uh, basically, it's similar to a workflow, except it is a kind of a bird's eye view of the whole industry um, that's being involved in getting a particular task or job done. So from raw materials to a finished product. And what does that mean, right? We're showing steps. We're not showing companies again. We're looking for the value proposition at each step. So let's think about pizza, for example. So pizza, how complicated can pizza honestly be? Um, so pizza, let's say Papa John's. We're going to use Papa John's as the example, right? Normally you would just think, oh, I'll just get the ingredients, make the pizza, and eat the pizza. But when you start to think about like uh, chain stores like Papa John's, it gets quite a bit more complicated the overall value chain, because you have to get uh, various ingredients from different suppliers, um, from different raw material suppliers. So you're talking about, um, so for example, like the cheese, right, coming from dairy farmers 
dairy farmers send it to a cheese processor, right, or a supplier that is going to take the cheese from the farm and literally, you know, process it and package it and send it to a Papa John's distribution center. At that distribution center, it then gets sent out to a particular Papa John's store where it is then, um, there's a whole set of processes where it is stored appropriately um, and dated and all this, these other steps to ensure that it, you know, good quality cheese is used at the right time. Um, and then it goes, you know, the order is created inside the store. There's pizza assembly inside the store. And eventually the last step, the delivery person delivers the pizza to the person's home. So as you can see, like you think, oh, something simple like pizza is actually quite a bit more complex. There's a lot of players, there's a lot of stakeholders involved. And if you're, let's say you're, you know, doing something, that particularly helps the cheese supplier improve a particular process and it increases their, you know, time out the door by a few minutes. What, what you have to understand is, does that really make a difference? Does the Papa John's distribution center care about that change? Is it, is it a big enough change for them to care to pay the cheese processor more money um, or to help them integrate that new solution? Does the cheese processor care? I mean, if their buyer or the person they're distributing to doesn't really care about that increase in efficiency, it's not a big enough increase in efficiency to make a difference, then do they care enough to um, make changes in their, in their set of processes, in their factory, in their, dis in their center, um, if, it, if it's going to be a lot of lift on the front end? If it takes a lot to integrate your solution, and it's not providing that much value on the tail end to the overall value chain, the overall set of, of individuals that are involved, then perhaps they don't, they don't care to adopt your solution. It's just not worth the lift. So mapping and workflows and value chains are all an excellent way for you to start to think about how different jobs to be done by the customer or stakeholder for your teams to be able to map those out. Um, for them to take what they're hearing in the interviews and start to make sense about uh, sense of them in a in a step by step sort of way. Uh, one thing that we often do with teams when we're teaching this idea of making sense of qualitative data or mapping qualitative data um, is we take them through an exercise called how to make toast. Um, and I'll go through it very briefly here. We're not going to do this exercise but I'll just go through um, how it runs uh, in case you decide to use it. You can also just Google how to make toast. There's loads of information about this as a, as a mechanism for teaching um, the value of mapping and the value of process mapping and jobs to be done to um, a room of individuals. So how to make toast. Very simple. You're just going to ask your teams or the participants in your kickoff to individually by themselves uh, draw out the steps to make toast. Um, and you guys can try this at home with your family members if you want to, but you don't have to. The point is, is that once they're done drawing, you give them about five minutes to do that, then you ask them to share. And the point is, is that everybody has their own individual perception of the steps that it takes to make toast. Some people start with growing the wheat. Some people start with buying the bread. Some people start with getting the bread out of the pantry. Some people end by taking a bite of the toast. Some people end by just taking the toast out of the toaster. Um, some people, you know, figure out what they want to put on their toast. And then we've even had some folks actually draw how to make a toast. <laughs> so some people don't pay attention to the directions um, and, you know, draw out what it means to make a toast at a wedding or a speech at a, at a special event. Um, so this is a great exercise that really gets, drives the point home that, you know, the, the reason that they have to talk to so many different individuals to better understand a set of jobs to be done or a bunch of processes is that each individual is going to have their own perception about how that process works, what's important, where it starts, where it ends. And by talking to many different individuals, the teams can get a better, a better grasp of what, what is really going on. Um, and where their solution really might have an opportunity to help uh, mitigate any pains or problems in the existing process or set of processes. So why, just as a reminder, why is stakeholder so essential to, to mapping and why is mapping so essential to stakeholder discovery? Um, Essentially, we all have different start and stop points. We all visualize the steps of a process differently. We have different tools or ingredients that we might use if we're at a particular part of the process. 
um, you know, who is making the toast. So it changes the, who is going through the process, changes the perspective on how the process gets accomplished, what they value, their value proposition, what their motivations and behaviors are. Um, and all that stuff is really important when developing solutions for these individuals because you need to better understand where their head's at and what they need out of their job um, in order to create a solution that's going to be adopted. Um, so as a final reminder from this lecture, you know, hopefully these different tools um, and the, the idea of developing insights can all be beneficial for your teams when they're trying to make sense of these interviews, they're trying to make sense of their notes and the quotes that they're hearing and how can they integrate them into their, into their solution, into their value propositions, their customer segments, definition, their business thesis, their business model canvas, all those gold tools that they should be iterating on uh, week by week in their programs. They should all, ultimately, the changes that they're creating in these iterations should all be evidence-based. They should be able to pull it from a particular interview or set of interviews. They should be able to point to who they talked to and what they heard. Um, again, everything in this presentation, in this lecture, it's, it's more of a nice to have. It's a good thing to have in your back pocket in case your teams get stuck. Um, but not necessarily something that has to be included um, in a kickoff event or in a, in a short, especially in short form programs. Um, and certainly not something that you have to require every team to map, to create each of these maps. They're, it's, it's meant to be a toolbox from which they can pull things that they think that they themselves need to use or would be beneficial for their, them and their team um, to help them make sense of all the information, the qualitative information that they're hearing. So I hope this was helpful. Um, we are, you know, again, I hope this was helpful and um, looking forward to talking to everybody again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Oh, we'll be doing a Q&A on this lecture um, in tomorrow we'll, uh, when we first get started. So if you have any specific questions you want to ask or more detail that you're looking to have elaborated, um, please feel free to come in with questions. Thank you.